just a little background on Troy. So Troy is the founder and CEO of Source. He's going to get into what they do a lot better than I could describe. But um, just as a human being, Troy has been an excellent mentor in sort of providing me with a lot of foresight ahead of founding and launching a successful business. And I think what we're going to talk about today, hopefully is as useful as possible to you as you're thinking about the ebbs and flows of your own business. So whether you're just at the very start of your journey and looking to see like what could come in the future, or if you're already well down that path and you realize like, hey, this might be time for a change. Um, so really what we're gonna focus on today is talking all about pivoting. And I will say that we're gonna have you know, an interview style discussion here, but we also wanna start including your thoughts or ideas or questions as a part of that too. Um, so for the first few minutes, that's probably gonna be mostly me and Troy talking here. Um, but what I would love is if you could post any questions that you have in that Q&A channel on the right side of the screen. Um, under chat, you should then be able to select Q&A. If you wanna drop questions in there, um, Alex is gonna rejoin the stage once we get through the, the first part of the discussion and allow us to kind of go through and answer some of those questions together. Um, with that, I'll stop talking and I'll kick it off to Troy. Um, I would, Troy, I would love for you to tell the people who is Troy Sultan and what does he do? Thanks, Eric. And hi, everybody. I'm quite excited to be here and share a little bit of, of our story and have a discussion with Eric, who uh, I've known for a while. And I think um, that might enable us to go a little bit deeper and be a little more vulnerable, which is one of my... Uh, noted goals for today there are some things that i was debating whether or not i'd get into but i'm gonna i'm gonna challenge myself to to give you the the, the raw version today so who is troy sultan when you asked that funny enough eric i remembered weirdly I had a flashback to a three-day startup a sort of hackathon essentially i did a decade and change ago in college and and uh, i was given at the end of that a spray painted red bull can that was spray painted gold and it came with the award of the hopeless entrepreneur and <laughs> that's that's the short of it um i've been sort of building and starting what i've i usually refer to as companies for quite a long time and most of them haven't quite worked or we've squiggled our way into something that worked um, from an early idea that didn't and so by um, university, I studied marketing and minored in commu computer science, um, primarily with the goal of realizing I was never going to be capable of working in software short of finding other people who understood software. And I needed to understand those people uh, in order to figure out how to work with them. And, and that set me off um, <clears throat> really on a couple of random events that led to me tripping and falling into an early stage startup based out of Gainesville, Florida called Groove Shark, which was a music streaming service um, that was popular before Spotify. And being a very early company run by a bunch of folks who didn't know what they were doing, including me, we all just had titles way above our head and started running functions when we just didn't have anybody else to do it. And my first sort of real title was um, leading the recruiting function. Uh, and it, it, uh, opened up a lot for me and our business today resource spans a couple different products, uh, SaaS products in the recruiting space. We build a CRM for recruiting teams along with a full platform for delivering a better interview experience remotely to candidates. And so that's the high level and short of it. And I'm happy to talk about the less sexy pieces, which is the 98% of the story. And that's great. I think it, it provides some good context here on RIP Groove Shark. Um, mm -hmm. I remember back in the day, that was the the popular service. And what we've now iterated through, I think, like three wow. different generations of music streaming services since. So yep. um, would love to understand kind of what inspired you to start Resource in the first place. So I know you're working at Groove Shark that, you know, didn't necessarily pan out. You moved to San Francisco after that. Tell me about that part of the journey kind of leading up to when you said, hey, there needs to be a company to fill this need here. Yeah, it's funny because you hear a lot of sort of startup, bits of startup advice that are very strongly delivered often. Um, and 
they're quite confusing or they were to me in the early days. And one of the ones that I always remember is you should never start a company just to start a company. Um, you should, you, you know, you, you should be really passionate about a problem and then pursue that because you have no choice on some level. And I kind of didn't do that at all. I kind of just was dead set from like the earliest age I can remember on like starting companies. And there was a lot of problems that I was passionate about. I realized that if I thought deeply enough about a hard enough problem, I could become really passionate about it. Like it was the process that was really exciting to me. Um, and so I, I sort of worked in recruiting by somewhat of an accident and learned about lots of pain uh, that came along with that role and then decided, well, I started to sort of hypothesize that there was a, there was probably a myriad of different solutions to be built around these problems. And this might be quite a ripe space to work in, but I nonetheless decided that building SaaS companies for in the B2B space was really boring and probably pretty easy. And I'll do that, you know, later on in my thirties when, you know, I'm done scratching my consumer itch. So that led me to like flop on multiple consumer mobile apps that really didn't fit into my strengths, my domain expertise, or my skill set. And none of these are on my LinkedIn profile. None of these do I talk about much ever. And um, they they though are a big part of the story. And and so I would I would work in recruiting. I joined Google at one point to really understand how a big organization worked because that was something that I was deeply curious about. Um, but in the process was building mobile apps with friends on the side that never really took off and ultimately realized that everything pointed back to uh, me having some strengths in the space that I uh, worked in recruiting. And so I was like, okay, people keep hiring me or as a consultant or a recruiter to do things in this space. And I can't really seem to stop it. And so I need to more seriously consider the problems that I know to exist here and ultimately um, <laughs> became extremely passionate about these problems pretty early on. So, I mean, there's something to be said about um, the passion arising from spending enough time on a problem and the problem space gets deeper and deeper and you meet more and more people who need or have the pain and need uh, problem solved and um, your strengths and expertise align. And that's that's kind of like what led us to resource, but the story of resource itself was very much a marriage of the problem and not the solution, as we like to say in the early days. So um, we're um, four or five iterations, like fundamental iterations from where we started. And I'm sure we're going to talk about that. Yeah. I mean, let's start with where you started though. So like, what was the initial vision for resource? Tell me about that. So there, there was no vision. Um, the initial vision, the extent of the original vision for resource was Recruiting has a number of real problems that people have real pain around and have real budget to spend on, but there's a, a, a strong or rather a sweeping lack of, of solutions that were seemingly appeasing and, and uh, solving these problems in the market. So we actually decided, hey, we want to build a long-term software company. And so in order to figure out the right angle and path to doing that, um, we're going to actually start uh, with a service business and we're going to start consulting. And so in, uh, instead of building software, we went and got a few clients and we said, hey, look, um, we want to recruit for you. We know you have a recruiting problem. We know you're hiring recruiting agencies. We, wanna, we want you to hire us instead. We want to charge you less than the market charges. So we kind of came in about a 30% cheaper than like standard rates. And we also said, hey, look, we have an ulterior motive that we want to be clear about. We really want to build software in this space. And we're not exactly sure where we want to start. But we want to like consult and deliver on the promise that we'll engage with you on delivering candidates. It was various sort of um, angles to it. But as long as you let us poke around, we're going to be pretty weird. We're going to ask weird questions. We're going to poke around your business. And we want you to know it's because we're ultimately looking to build something different than what we're selling you today. And that actually helped filter our clients out um, quite a bit. A lot of folks that weren't comfortable with that. Um, kind of self-selected out and a few early stage entrepreneurs um, who really understood or had a respect for the process were like, hell yeah, and we'll help you do this. Um, and so um, we started to do that and quickly realized um, that there was a path beyond the pure services. Um, and I'm sure, uh, yeah, we might want to get into that too. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to me about that. So when, when did that transition happen from services to software and what, what were you actually building when that did happen? 
Yeah. So initially we were just a bunch of, of spreadsheets and one of our earliest clients was Andrew Mason, the, uh, one of the founders of Groupon, of Groupon fame and uh, detour later on. And, um, he had about a five person team starting a new company at the time. And he was very involved in the recruiting process. And what we said, we were just effectively reaching out to candidates as a third party and saying, we're working with this company and here's why it's interesting. You might want to chat with them. But rather, um, because he was so willing to experiment with us, we ran an experiment early where we reached out to about 100 potential hires for him as us, as a third party representing his business. And we gave him the same or very similar message to send to a sub, a, another set of 100 candidates as him. And our curiosity was, would more people engage based on the sort of brand or the identity of the person reaching out? And I think at the time he had something like a three times greater response rate. And this was like our first big aha moment. And it was an aha moment for him too. Uh, his goals were to get more candidates in their hiring pipeline. And so he suggested to us, how about I do all of the outreach and you do all of the back end work. I'll just put my name on it basically. And after running that experiment, it was quite uh, it was successful enough that we actually immediately used that as our per first pivot point. And we said, you know what, from today forward, we don't do this service that we've done for the last six months. Um, we actually do this service, which is we will recruit for you as you. And we know what you what what you're frustrated about with the recruit part recruiting agencies. Um, they're the middlemen, they sort of get in the middle of the negotiation, you can't control the candidates experience. So we're going to actually deliver um, the same sort of service level, but we're going to use your identity. And that was actually differentiated enough in the beginning that we were able to bring on another couple of clients on that model. At it. So you basically got that spun up. You started sort of systematizing this ability to recruit as businesses and things kind of got a little slow again after that. So tell me about how you responded in that scenario where you realize like, okay, Hey, the market might be catching up or there might be needs for a broader type of solution. So we, we didn't have software at this point and, mm -hmm. and I'm, I couldn't build software, which always is kind of a hard problem for me to solve yet. Um, we had a business that was sort of making a bit of money and we, we realized that there was a cap on it. There was only so much we can scale with services but what we were starting to do seemed to be a ripe problem or solution for automation and so we started basically building software on the back of a known problem that was being run on top of spreadsheets and inside of a shared inbox for our clients so we would just have a login to their gmail inbox literally and do manual work as them and then there was like a proliferation of sales tools happening at the same time for um, sales engagement um, sales development, outreach.io, Persist IQ was brand new at the time. And these were highly innovative. And I remember we had a clear aha moment again, where we saw what the sales tools were doing. And we were basically doing that for our clients manually. And so we immediately started building like a quasi software solution, where instead of us logging into our client's inbox, they could have a, a interface where they linked to their email, added their own messaging, which we were previously writing for them. And then we basically just did the lead generation. We would do research in the market, find appropriate candidates, drop them into their account. It would trigger an email as the client. And so now we're a software and a service business. Uh, we had uh, really just a small component that was software, but we were progressing in the direction we wanted to, because again, when we started, we were hell bent on building software. We just didn't know what the hell to build. <laughs> Makes sense. I mean, learning from your customers and your market and being able to iterate pretty rapidly makes a big difference, you know, especially if you're, if you're running a service, um, that's something you can switch instantaneously, right? There's no code to write. It's literally just, yep. hey, all right, we're going to start doing this process this way. Um, so tell me about how far that sort of like hybrid approach took you um, and where, you, where did you realize that things needed to change again? So we actually got that business 
to, I want to say about 15 grand a month in revenue, though our margins weren't great because we were employing um, various contract researchers around the world to do a lot of the behind the scenes work. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't, it, it wasn't SaaS revenue and yet it was recurring for the most part. And we got into a startup accelerator at the time, 500 startups on the back of having been able to generate real revenue with such little software. And this was particularly what excited them about us was that we figured out how to deliver a solution that was worth paying for um, with really rudimentary software. And so I think they just got excited about our ability to hustle ultimately. And once we got in to 500 startups, we were in a pressure cooker of um, trying to figure out the big vision narrative to raise a bunch of money by demo day. And we really forced a couple narratives um, to try to fit into the expectations that the venture model really placed on us at the time. And we started trying on sort of different visions. And one of them was sort of like AWS for talent. Um, we, we had a couple angles and they were never really truly authentic to us. I think we really tried to see and believe them, but ultimately um, decided not to demo day at our accelerator because we believed we weren't ready to raise money. And it was odd to us that 50 companies in a batch were all expected to raise money on the same day. Um, yet every business was different. And so we kind of used that as our rationale for sort of bowing out and doing some more fundamental thinking. And during that process, um, we, we doubled down on our operational efficiency. So I mentioned a bunch of contractors that were doing research for us manually behind the scenes for the service we were selling, generating leads for the clients that we brought on, dropping them into their account, and then triggering uh, sourcing emails, recruiting emails on their behalf. And what we did was we said, we know the inefficiency in this process because we're paying for it. We are, we are writing the Google documents to train the contractors and going through all of the manual steps. And we can automate a lot of this for ourselves. And so what we did was we built a uh, Chrome extension that enabled our own team of contractors to with one click identify a profile on the internet, um, source that profile into the relevant customer, and then trigger those those email communications on their behalf. And we brought on uh, an early customer advisor at the time. DoorDash was one of our earliest clients, and their head of talent um, was quite excited about the service we were delivering them. And so we set up a monthly meeting with him where he'd come to our office and sort of look at our business and try to help tell us what more we can do. And this was purely a function of meeting someone who just wanted to help us, was excited about our uh, business. We were helping him, but he really wanted to sort of advise. And um, that turned out to be pivotal because there was one day where he actually caught a glimpse on one of our computers of the Chrome extension, the piece of software that we wrote for our own internal team to help deliver the service to his company. And I, I'll never forget this moment. He's like an ex-college athlete. He's like six foot four and towering over me. And he's like, why the hell does my team not have that? And we were like, well, would you pay for it? Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. And <laughs> Long story short, he, he was quite excited to pay for it and was telling us that he was already paying quite a real amount of money for a piece of software that didn't do uh, quite what ours was doing. It was like half of, of what ours was doing and he had to cobble them together. And so what we did was we said, look, we have an opportunity here. We have one customer. We don't know how many would think this is useful. We're, we're amazed that somebody wants this, first of all. This is like a total hack. It's not ready to be used by a customer, but with his commitment, we would have enough confidence to, to go heads down for a month and like rewrite it to work for his use case, which is what we did. And we ultimately got him to actually sign a letter of intent, which became our first paid contract that if we can deliver what he's seeing on our screen to his, his team of recruiters, 
he would pay us X amount. And the moment that he signed that, which was dumbfounding to us again, we had no idea. We had no idea why he thought this was interesting or useful. We had imposter syndrome, you could say, quite badly. And we went heads down and rebuilt it uh, over a few weeks or a month and gave it to his team. And then that was the jumping off point for what became really the first SaaS iteration of our business. Yeah, and I, I remember that kind of fondly uh, as talking a little bit about this, uh, where you were trying to pitch Envoy on services, but also were like, oh, by the way, we're also going to do this software thing. Um, it was a very interesting time for you. I mean, how did the how did the team respond to that? Because I think the team was very sort of like services or operationally oriented at that point in time. Yeah, this was... I mean, we, with all of the things we did wrong, one thing we never wavered on was, and, and this may be a better answer to your vision question. Like we didn't have a specific vision, but we did absolutely know we wanted to build software because we believed that there was the only way to reach the scale and impact uh, on the problems that we cared about in recruiting. And so from day one, anybody that worked with us knew our plan and that would never change as we grew our company and our team. And I like this caused challenges later too, which might be worth talking about. But one thing, one example I like to use was, you know, if, if, if Elon Musk picked, uh, recruited all of his early hires at Tesla on the basis of joining a sports car company, every one of those hires would be sadly mistaken about what they were joining. Um, and so being able to articulate at least what you're not was really helpful for us. And it actually helped us punch above our weight class and bring hires on who cared about the thing that we wanted to become, which was a recruiting software business serving some of these problems. And so from day one, we always had a saying internally, which was to, re to recruits especially and investors, uh, we are problem centric, solution agnostic as a business. We know the problem we want to work on for the next 10 to 20 years, and we anticipate our solution to these problems will change dramatically. And so we were, we were steadfast on that point from day one. And that caused these pivots, if you will, to be very easy. And I will say that most people on the inside, it was fairly seamless. Most people on the outside actually just thought we were full of shit. Like I, I remember many a conversations uh, where investors would just walk out of the room and say, look, I, I, I hear you. You guys want to build software. You're just not going to be able to walk away from this service money. I mean, you're going to have to shut down this business. You can't do both. And we heard that at every juncture along the way. Um, we had employees walk away on that basis. But what we did have was clarity on what we wanted to do. And so that enabled the people who did believe to join. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it set the right expectations, too, which probably aligned you best with when you did actually raise money as well, right? Which, I mean, you, you can speak to as well, but probably the biggest nightmare in startup land is putting a marriage, so to speak, together onto your board and having misalignment on values or vision or direction because you can't really undo that. Employees similarly, but they're easier to undo. So I think we wanted the most ugly and risky sides of our business to be the most clear before we entered those relationships. And how, I mean, how did you go about sort of finding the right partner as a result? It sounds like a lot of folks, you know, like when you go to a pitch meeting, they're expecting like the, the rosy, you know, sun-filled meadow that you're going to be prancing through and not necessarily the, the rocky ravine that's on the other edge of it. We, you know, we learned our way by bumping into the walls, mm -hmm. um, but we did have one early hypothesis, which was everybody that's pitching investors are, are likely coming in with the most sunshine version of their pitch. And because the power dynamic is favoring investors, we believe that if we made ourselves harder to get by confining what we were willing to partner with by making the constraints more narrow, it might actually favor us in terms of optics but it, and demand, but it certainly would filter out 
it would eliminate the likelihood that we had a bad fit. So we knew that we were going to have way more rejection early, but we knew that the odds that the fit that we did find, if we found it, um, that it would work out would be higher. And that was really all that mattered to us. So we would say things to investors like, look, we're a pretty strange company. We are evolutionary, not revolutionary, we used to say. Um, recently, I had a friend say, you guys, you guys are, you mutate. Your company just keeps mutating. And I was like, I like that word. That, that feels more like us. Um, but we would say, look, we can't, uh, we can't afford to partner with a spreadsheet investor who's going to be asking us month over month for metrics. Because, for example, we're in the process of shutting down a business that's on track to a $1 million run rate to pivot to a software business that's doing, you know, $1,000 a month in revenue. And so our metrics are going to go like this for several quarters before they go like this. And oh, by the way, we anticipate this is going to happen multiple more times. And so if, if we don't bring on an investor that's comfortable with the fact that we're going to throw away or shed our old skin in service of taking a bigger bet, um, that we think has a higher upside and might be much more risky. We wanted to find the people that love that equation that were like, look, you're going to flounder around, but the bets you're going to take are big. And even if you have like a medium, if, you, if you're on track to hit a double and there's an opportunity that you see to hit a grand slam, you're going to, you're going to sort of swing and miss on the double. So you can keep your eye on the, the bigger outcome. And that was always clear as clear as we can make it. And I think the harder part became, following through and actually shutting down multiple businesses, which we've done, um, that were doing well by many standards, because in our view, they weren't doing good enough. Yeah, so let's dig into some of the specifics of some of those cases too, because um, I'd love to kind of get into some of the practical, like what, what were some of the early signs, for example, that you knew you needed to spin down the services business? So we, uh, after that first contract uh, with DoorDash for our software, we, we hustled our way into about four other conversations where recruiting teams uh, with a leader like the one that just bet on us um, were willing to try our software for free. So we didn't yet have the like confidence to charge for it, even though we had one customer, but we had the confidence to ask people whether it was useful like ask for their time, and, which we did. And we did a one month trial with each of them. We said, look, we're building this new thing. We don't know what to call it. It's kind of weird, but we have one customer that finds it really useful. And we'd like to give it to you for free for one month with no expectations whatsoever that you use it after. And if you think it's really valuable, we can talk about price. We did sort of all the wrong things. We set expectations very ambiguously, but for those remaining four, we, I remember walking into the offices when we physically went to the office of customers to have this like sort of, well, what's the verdict conversation? And we purposely set our pricing high and our minimum contract at one year because our belief was if customers opted into this, it was a real pain. It was a big enough pain that we were solving. And we'd rather miss high than low. Like we'd rather, um, yeah. And so, the next four conversations, I remember like a couple of us on the team would look at each other. We'd like cross our fingers, dap each other before walking in the office and be like, we don't know if these people, we'd have metrics, we had nothing. We didn't know if they were going to say, we haven't even opened the web page since, you know, a month ago, basically. I mean, we had a little bit of data points, but, or this is the most valuable thing on, on the planet. We had no clue. And we walked out of the next four with all four agreeing to a one-year contract. Um, and at that moment, we were we were ready to bet the house. Um, we weren't confident that this was going to be a really big business, but we were confident it was going to be a bigger business than our our service business. And so immediately, we emailed all of our service customers who were paying us quite a lot of money, and we said, "Here's a, a timeline upon which we're actually going to sunset the service." And we had those conversations. We had about six or seven clients there, and there were two or three of them that were. It's totally self-managing and on autopilot. And so we just actually, we didn't tell them that we were sunsetting the business. We let them know we're, we're betting on other things and we're going to keep maintaining this level of service, but we will never be able to increase the amount of service for you. And if you ever decrease the amount of service, 
we likewise won't be able to re-increase it. So use this until it's no longer useful and then it won't exist anymore. Um, grow out of this, please. And it's funny, today we just sold off a core uh, part of our SaaS business line uh, to a competitor, which we've yet to announce. But um, as part of that deal, we had one legacy company still paying for our service. Uh, five years later, we've probably generated close to a million dollars from that sole client over the years who just never would leave the damn thing and stop paying us. So we kept it up and supported it. It's really interesting. I was going to ask you about how customers responded to this, right? Because like, especially if you're making all of these changes to your service, how does that affect their sort of trust or faith in you as a partner to deliver value? It's a very tricky balance and we're facing it again. And I think that um, it goes back to expectations though it's still quite hard because the more clear you set the expectation that your offering will evolve, often the less the customer wants to trust the bet because they don't want the rug to be pulled out from under them in a year. And so um, in our case, each of our new iterations would sell into and solve problems for the same archetype of customer. So often when we delivered the news that things were changing, we didn't just say we're taking this thing away from you, but we said, mm -hmm. one, we have plans to no longer support this, but here's why we think this is good and ultimately going to be good for you. It's because we're investing in this other thing that we'd love to talk to you about. And that actually made it really a lot, well, not really easy, I would say easier to have warmer conversations that got us our first few customers each time we made a pivot. And so um, it didn't always work. And what our commitment was in these scenarios was we were not gonna pull a rug out from a customer in a way that materially impacted their business negatively. So if, if they pushed back on us and said, we have a lot riding on this service being offered for three months and you're offering a two month sunrise uh, timeline, it was, a, it was a no brainer for us to extend for them. So, so we were really like, we need to make sure that we do this in a way that is, is productive and creates biz, leaves business continuity for you. Let's collaborate on how we're gonna do this. So early and often we had those conversations, yet there is no silver bullet here. They were all hard conversations, though some of them um, turned into phenomenally excited customers of the new product that we were building. And that gave us again, that new early confidence that we had something worthwhile again. And we had done this really through a couple of iterations of our software. Got it, that makes sense. And like, I think, you have to grow with your customers sometimes, especially if you're you know, solving a problem with them and for them, right? If you go to them and say, hey, is this a more important problem to you? Right, like that's what you should be solving for. Um, don't sit around and wait and just say, okay, well, cool. We're just not gonna do that, but thank you for telling me, right? Like that could actually hurt your relationship just as much as doing something that's different potentially. There, there's one other point, you know, that I think was important for us, which is while in the beginning, we only really had a vision for the problem space we wanted to work in, we started to develop an increasingly clear vision for the type of solution we believed we wanted to use to transform part of the industry over time. And we had to be convicted about that. And we were because we had done very deep thinking. Uh, in the eyes of our customer across many customers. And, and when we started having conversations about our most recent product, which we're again betting our, our future on uh, in the realm of, of the interview experience, um, we had customers, big brand logos, customers whom we were proud to represent on our website, tell us that they think we were making a grave mistake. And these are probably some of the most gut-wrenching conversations I've ever had because what we were hearing were people that had known us to deliver, had worked for us for years and continued to buy our software despite its its changes in evolution and their business changing, 
yet we're at this most recent juncture when we were taking a really a, a bigger bet, a bigger leap with a more innovative solution that didn't have a easy analogy for customers to understand. They would tell us that they, they didn't believe in us. And we had multiple conversations like this and um, time will tell whether or not we're right, but um, we stuck to our guns um, because we used the data set of not one or two anecdotal customers. We used the data set of the trends we were seeing in the market. And we knew that with new innovative products, there's most people aren't going to get it at first. I mean, how many people turned down Airbnb because they thought it was a ridiculous idea? Um, it's, it's about finding the few people who do believe. Um, but it is a fine line between um, being convicted and being delusional. Yeah, I was gonna I'm say, not sure which side of that we're walking. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that's, um, that's <laughs> usually pretty tough and can kind of wear on you both as a founder as well as wear on the team too when you're you're kind of in this i, I don't necessarily, necessarily saw it, call it a crisis but like it is an existential dilemma that you've forced yourself into which says like hey we need to decide who we are fundamentally so like how did that affect you and how did that affect your team i think i was less impacted because i have a healthy amount of sort of naivete and a belief that like sticking to a guaranteed path, a linear path of growth that's you can see a few years out and it's pretty likely you could just follow the data and the growth versus taking a bigger bet with lower odds, but that can really curve you up in terms of impact. I'm always willing to take the swing and miss personally. And I've communicated that to our team a lot. And so they've joined on the basis of my definition of risk which I spend a lot of time communicating. It's more risky in my opinion, not to take the risks because our end goal is very clear. It's to really transform the space. And so um, that said, we had many hiccups with employees who, who either didn't internalize or once faced with the real pivot internally, really had a hard time navigating it. Um, and I think I, I can point to many examples where um, employees at these um, inflection points would almost read, would take the wrong wrong message or would read too far in one direction on say the fact that the new thing we were building that was being say powered by the fact that we had a core business that was growing, but yet we were not satisfied. We wanted to take a bigger bet. We would have employees who, who would feel neglected if they were working on the core business, which was supporting our R and D, right? The, the R and D became the sexy object culturally, and it became a much harder to motivate people to work on the thing that internally we looked at as just a means to an end. And so that was a really complex problem that we navigated multiple times. And the reality is um, I could have communicated, we could have set better expectations, but we didn't know uh, where we were going at a lot of these junctures. So we just knew abstractly things would change. We didn't know what that meant, but in the end, you, you might just have to move on from relationships that don't um, serve both parties in the end. You have to kind of take a bullet um, and, and we've had to take those over time. Yeah, that's, I think, one of the hardest parts about fundamental change that happens inside of a business is, yeah, I mean, it, the ultimately, there is the company's definition of what is acceptable risk and what strategy is, and that might be different than each individual's, at least slightly, but the one that it can't be different than is the CEO's. Um, so if the CEO or the founding team are misaligned around what is acceptable risk and how we can position that effectively, that's really going to hurt your business because you're not going to be taking those, those bets that are worth taking in the context of that business too. Beat home the mission, hire on the mission. Like that's the advice mm -hmm. to my younger self. If you center everything on the mission of the business, the problem, there's less blowback when the solution changes. And I think we tried to do this and didn't execute as well as we could have, but hire, sell and fundraise on the mission, on the problem you're trying to change in the world. 
and then let the how be subject to change. There's always going to be better solutions, uh, you know, if you continue to grow. I love it. Hundred percent alignment there. Um, I know we've been chatting a lot. Um, I believe we probably got some questions from the audience. So Alex is going to rejoin us here in a moment. First of all, thank you, Troy, for all of this as well. And I guess uh, for our any of the folks who are joining here today that maybe have other questions uh, for you that come up later, what, what might be the best way to get in touch? Yeah. Um... I'm on Twitter at destroy Sultan. Um, my email, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm sort of on my email, like the younger generation seems to be on Instagram. Um, it's just Troy at guide.co, which is also a subtle hint at, um, sort of a, another upcoming big pivot, uh, and brand shift for our company in the coming months, uh, around, uh, the, the brand and product of guide. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I guess I'll say for the other folks um, here attending, if you want more information or resources on major pivots that folks have made in the business, I also had reached out to a friend of mine here in Atlanta um, about his big pivot. So the folks at Sales Loft went through a very similar type of experience where they actually had a multi-million dollar run rate product that they sunset a month before raising a Series A. And so uh, Kyle's actually a really prolific writer and you can find a lot of his stuff publicly on the internet too. Um, and he'll talk all about that, that journey and what it was like to sort of throw away the, the business that's making us money for the business that's uh, solving a bigger problem in the world. Awesome, thank you so much, Eric. Uh, Troy, that was a, a fascinating conversation. I mean, I, I've got a, I've actually sprinkled some questions that I've got directly into my my list of questions here. Um, so I received some directly on in the chat. I received some uh, some before from people who were who weren't able to attend. Who'll probably watch the recording. So I'll just kind of ask them in the in the order that I think uh, makes most sense. One that came in that was interesting to me as you guys kind of went through the conversation was how much did the speed of your decision making change each because it sounds like there were maybe like i don't know three or four sort of major pivot points for you how did that change that decision making process as you as you progress i don't think that it it changed much in terms of speed because of one thing that we knew which is that the thing we were currently working on was not the end game for us and so the moment we got to warm water in something else we laser focused with a clear goal, we would have a heuristic. What gives us enough conviction to bet the current business in this direction? Like what gives us enough conviction rather than uh, uh, to, to believe this is the next step on the staircase, even if it's mm -hmm. not the end step. And the moment we hit that one metric, it was usually super simple, like five paying SaaS customers to sunset our service business was our actual goal. Um, the moment we hit five, we just sent the emails and dealt with the blowback. So um, each time we set up one clear, simple goal, and we just, the moment that we hit it, there was just, there was no second guessing. We knew already, uh, we had no choice. There was no looking back. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So it's kind of like a message to your future self. Like, don't think back, have conviction, because this is what you set yourself, you've hit it, so just go. Exactly. Nice. So that that I, I, there's a question I, I was actually going to ask in a bit, but it, it, make, it makes sense now. So um, someone asked, is it possible to hedge your your decision to pivot when you have when, when you also have plans to kind of swing big? So it sounds like you you did sort of um, sit on the fence with that, you know, because you, you still ran the old the old kind of model, but you had that KPI. So I guess you've kind of answered the question, but if if you could kind of go into that a little bit more, that would be helpful. This is a hard one. Um, I'm not sure we did this well, and I could see a world in which our business could have went under in multiple times trying to do this. Um, but mm -hmm. we had a core business, uh, about 20 employees, and a, a million dollar AR SaaS product in our, our last business. And at the same time, we split out half and ultimately 75% pretty quickly of our engineering team onto R&D okay. with hypothesis but no product and so that was one of the hardest years in my career we spent about mm -hmm. a year in that orientation and it just caught it ultimately worked out but i would say fate prepare for a lot of headwinds 
this is when we had a lot of cultural challenges, people leaving, a lot of sort of weirdness in who got to work on what and what was going on. We were still small enough that everybody knew what was going on, but um, it was really hard. It's hard as a startup to build one product and serve one customer base. It is really painful to try to do a second one. And so frankly, if I had to do this all again, um, I think I'd spend more time envisioning um, the evolution of the business and come up with mm -hmm. somewhat of a, to use the Elon example, a master plan, even if it's simple. So I know what those phases look like and we can plan against them as opposed to hyper-focusing on one and then smuggling in the new plan on some day randomly and having to reorient. That was quite painful. Well, this, this is a question for me, actually, just based on what you were saying. Um, I think it was like Dustin Moskovitz or something. He talks about trying to reduce the amount of work about work as much as possible within a company and just focus on kind of doing. Um, like if you're, if you're kind of pivoting and, and trying to decide whether or not a new plan is the right way to go and you know you've obviously got to manage all the all the people as you were talking about there you know some people want to work on this some people work on, want to work on this how did you decide how much time you actually spent on the just the operational elements of transitioning rather than you know as opposed to just doing it <laughs> you know building yeah, and, and, and kind of speaking <laughs> to customers essentially which are the two most important things i guess instinct and a, a day-to-day week-to-week gut check um, you know, I used to say uh, when we were going through this, because I really didn't have a playbook for it, that every week we as a company should be getting more convicted about this new direction or less convicted about the new direction. There should never be a week where we have the exact same conviction we had last week. And so we really did into it our way through it. Some weeks I spent no time and like a couple of folks really laser focused and I had to keep the core business alive. But when you have employees that whose paychecks and jobs depend on you and, and join for a promise and customers, you're serving close to hundred customers that are constantly, they're betting on, on your software and your workflow to manage their process. Mm -hmm. There is no easy answer here. Um, it, it really was a matter of having acute attention on where the lowest ball was to make sure it mm -hmm. wasn't dropped. It, it was not science. Nice. I guess I, yeah. All right. Go ahead. I was just going to add something that we've done at Flatfile mm -hmm. fairly successfully um, has been broad forcing functions. So mm -hmm. a good example was you know we we were having some challenges in iterating quickly enough and also taking the appropriate bets in our product organization. So three months ago we just killed the entire roadmap and we said, hey, we mm -hmm. got to build this back up from scratch. And so like that forcing function all of a sudden puts everyone at the same page where it's like, hey, we have nothing. We'll treat this like we don't even have a business or a product yet. Now, how would we build this out? So like finding ways to get use those forcing functions to get everyone on the same level can be really beneficial because as a founder, you're always thinking ahead and always thinking about what comes next. Um, and then of course that the, how are we gonna do it's gonna creep into your mind, but you get the furthest by letting your team help create the how we're gonna do this. Um, mm -hmm. And you force the vision by creating that forcing function that allows them to think creatively within the new paradigm that you've set up. Yeah, I love that. I love that concept of forcing functions. and, and um, there's another one I've got here, which is about, I guess, you know, it sounded like it was all throughout the story, essentially it was customer feedback that was pulling you forward. Um, so this question here, uh, through which channel did, did most of your feedback come? Was it, was it kind of, was it sales? Was it the services functions that you were running? Was it the customer support? Yeah, it, I don't know if this, is untraditional or is becoming more common, but the most recent pivot of ours, which has been our most uh, dramatic and so far most successful, um, we did very actually much more specifically around this. And I highly recommend this process, which we somewhat stumbled into, but we ultimately just identified what we would consider the perfect early customer for the new hypothesis we had. And we wrote up a Google Doc that explained basically a um, 
a product process and ask a goal, a goal and ask, and we wanted to partner with their team for free. We weren't charging, but we, we needed like a systematic amount of time from this recruiting team at, you, you know, company X. And we reached out to the decision makers at about eight of them very specifically. And we wrote a custom Google doc that we shared in that email for each of them. And we say, Hey, we're building a new thing. We really think for these reasons, you are perfect. And if you're willing uh, to give us X, Y, and Z, we will give you the product for free for this amount of time. And we will, um, we will build it specific to your needs where there are gaps today. And so we will ask for a weekly call. We ask for a shared Slack channel between their, their team and ours, which has been absolutely a game changer for us. And um, we have a recurring 30 minute weekly call for research. That's our, we get to be selfish in that call. Mm -hmm. And they use the product in exchange. And we did this for 90 days and with about eight customers. So every Tuesday with eight back-to-back -back calls, we recorded, we transcribed, and we highlighted and tagged and organized every single one of them. And we have a trove of information about where there were gaps. Um, we learned our go-to-market from this. Who is the buyer? How do you make buying decisions? We like backed into a sales process, but share a Google doc, be extremely transparent with your ask, ask for time in exchange for the service, potentially money, depending on, on how evolved you are. Um, shared Google doc, and then a recurring meeting for a finite period of time. So it's, it's comfortable committing to, they know it will end. That was that that playbook is something that we hope to run many more times over. That is fascinating. I'd actually love to see a, 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 a kind of blog. I mean, it sounds like you've got enough on already, but it's, I'd love to see like a, a, a medium article just listing that out because that is that is fascinating. We yeah, I, I will share something with with you, Alex and and Eric. After there, we later came across a, a venture capital firm who wrote out like a guide for building what they call design partners. And it was like 90% of what we had stumbled on accidentally. We didn't even know that this was a thing. So I think the VC fund is unusual VC that writes yeah, yeah. like a pre-seed guide. And they have an incredible guide to how to build design partners. And it's it's like 90% there for, for, for what we did. That's, yeah, that, we're, that's we're running a design. We're running the design partnership program right now with a, a new product that we're building out. And so like, can't agree more with what Troy was saying. Like, treat the customers like design partners and make them feel like they have a part because they do have mm -hmm. a part in creating that solution. Um, find the profiles of customers that you feel like are going to get you the information you need to get to a solution that's going to be ready for the broader market. So, like, you'll want to find a few that maybe are different from each other, but not so different that they're entirely different buyers or cycles. <laughs> And then go for it, right? Like work with them on it. Um, and it's really engaging for those customers. And you would be surprised at how many people are willing to pay to do that too. I mean, we're not that, quite that as good almost... as Eric, but <laughs> yeah, we, we were not good enough as Eric to, to get them to pay. But I, I will, I want to highlight the forcing function that you brought into the conversation, Eric, around this. A byproduct of this process for us that was amazing was the fact that we knew we had a call in a week with eight customers yeah. who just complained about yeah. a bunch of stuff that we had to deliver for motivated yeah. us like nothing else. And so for three months, we've never moved faster on product. That's amazing. It's, it's like almost the optimal sales thing, right? Like you, you, you've, you've, you've created a, a persona and you've kind of found someone that fits that and you're reaching out with like the most tailored email possible and then you're working with them to do it. And it's almost like you could argue the validation you get from them committing time to you as a company, as opposed to just paying, it's almost more validation than even paying you because time is like the most important asset, right? This was our motto internally. It's harder to get an entire recruiting team's time weekly, yeah. in our view, than it was to get money. And so if we can get them to stay on these, engage yeah. the whole th throughout, it was a good proxy for who was willing to actually um, allocate budget. For sure. I mean, in comparison to the amount of, uh, amount of money that probably adds up to if the salaries of the people who are spending that much time. And then when you get to the stage where you're asking them to pay for the product, they're like, hey, that's nothing compared to like what we were giving right. you before. Great. And many chose um, to keep those conversations going after we gave them the option. You know, are you getting value wow. from these? Like, we're happy to keep going after they signed. And many of them s s decided to keep doing it. So we, we run this today uh, still and with, with, with many. And 
it, it's been really incredible. And I guess also like, you know, if you talk about enterprise sales, like that, that is the kind of thing that huge enterprise customers actually often would pay a large amount of money for, right? Like it's like very tailored kind of working groups with a, a, the product team who are building the product for you. So yeah, it's amazing um, thing to integrate into your business model as you grow. Nice. Um, that was kind of going to be the, the final question I was going to ask is how open are you during your sales? Pits? Really, you, you kind of use it as part of your story, right? You, you use it as part of your business story that this is how you have evolved your product. Is that a sort of fair assumption? Yeah, what we did is we, we made it additive at first. We would say, we're launching a new product. Uh, and here's the process we're running. It's a, it's a, it, we're becoming a second product company. And back to the hedge bit, we weren't entirely sure whether or not it would work, in which case we would revert back to kind of growing our core business until the next um, idea. And so we did, um, we did, we approached it. Ultimately, once we had the, enough conviction, we hit that metric to actually sunset our previous business. In the most recent case, um, that business was doing good enough that sunsetting it, um, our version of that was we were able to sell it off very luckily to a competitor. Um, but but we, uh, we certainly knew that it wasn't, uh, we didn't have enough conviction to, to, to turn it off. Like we had too, too much riding on it, but it certainly was fuel. Yeah. Well, I think it's been a, a fast, I'm aware the, the, the hour is up, but it's been a fascinating conversation. Um, you know, one thing I particularly liked was your, your motto around problem centric, solution agnostic. I think that's a, a really nice way to sort of encapsulate the last hour of conversation. And um, thank you so much for your time, Troy. And, and I appreciate you running around Mexico trying to find a place of internet connection so you could uh, take, take the call today. And Eric, thank you so much for um, you know running, running the interview and um, putting your hand up to, to, to run our first ever B2B SaaS industry chapter event. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll do more of these. Obviously we're recording the event uh, so anyone who is on, you know, part of the B2B SaaS um, sub community, I guess, within our membership, obviously can watch this back um, and we'll put the recording on the on our private YouTube channel for our members as well. Thank you so much, everyone who's watching in the future and watching currently and have a great rest of your day, everyone.